great to have you with us now for this week's edition of The Public Square from the American Policy Roundtable. I'm Wayne Shepard. Something a little different coming up now, uh, because part of our team, Dave Zanotti and Rob Walgate, along with producer Alan C. Duncan, sat down for a conversation with Bill Cosgrove, CEO of Union Home Mortgage, all about the real estate business and mortgages and uh, real estate in this country. Something very interesting to all of us. So let's join them for the conversation. Here's Dave. So um, I'm going to start off and just ask you, in, in as brief a fashion as you're comfortable with, mm-hmm. the union home mortgage story. Uh, is this something that you grew up dreaming about? Is it something that you inherited? How did you start a business like this? Yeah. So it, it you know, it's a, it's an interesting story. So when, um, you know, it really starts with, I grew up in Bedford, Ohio, just about what, 35, 40 minutes from here. And, um, you know, my, uh, my mom and dad, are both from uh, Uniontown, Pennsylvania, which is about 50 miles south of Pittsburgh and um, about 10 minutes, uh, 15 minutes actually from Morgantown, West Virginia. And uh, when they were young, you know, they came up to Cleveland for work. And um, I tell the story that uh, uh, I'm the oldest and, you know, they, my mom had me when she was 21, 22 years old, which was obviously very common for that generation. But, uh, I, I tell the story that my dad was such an overachiever uh, in in Southwest Pennsylvania in the eighth grade. Uh, he made a uh, business decision that he didn't need to attend the ninth grade. So uh, you know, which which again in those in those days, you know, in the early fifties, uh, back in coal mine towns of Southwest Pennsylvania, was not all that odd. So. Uh, my dad spent 35 years in a warehouse uh, job, one job up here in uh, in Cleveland. They came for work because, you know, back in Pittsburgh, you were either going to be in a steel mill uh, or you're going to be in the coal mine. Neither one uh, appealed to him. And uh, he ended up being a, a pretty smart guy for an eighth grade education. But uh, that's what he did. And my mother was actually in light industrial, which most young people, do, they really don't know that term. Uh, but that's just uh, warehouse work and, and uh, industrial work for women. So there's nobody in my family that that had any professional background whatsoever. And for some reason, I was just running around, you know, going to, going to college part time, not really understanding what I wanted to do as a young person. And for some reason, I had an interest in real estate. And I really don't know why. Uh, don't know why whatsoever. But at 21 years old, I, I obtained my real estate license. And I was, Dave, I was too naive to know that most adults didn't want to buy a home from a child, right? A 21-year-old <laughs> child. So, uh, and actually back in those days before there were cell phones, uh, I lived at home, you know, because my mom and dad were really cool people. I didn't have any money. And my mother would answer the phone. And the next thing I know, my mother's talking to real estate agents uh, and then she, you know, after 10 minutes, I'm thinking it's a, f- a family friend. And after 10 minutes, my mom would hand me the phone and said, Billy, the phone's for you. <laughs> and I'm like, mom, you can't do this. I'm trying to. You I'm, had an assistant I'm at trying, a young I did, age. I you did. I did. I had an assistant before there were assistants. Um, <laughs> you know, so at, at 23, I, 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 I got, I found myself in the mortgage business, not, not on the real estate side, but the mortgage side. And I fell in love with it. Uh, as a 23 year old kid, I fell in love with it. And uh, got with a group of guys and, um, you know, got pretty good at it. You know, was one of the top loan officers in Northeast Ohio by the time I was in my uh, late 20s. And then um, when I was 32, I went to work for then called Union Home Mortgage. And there was an old German fella who owned the company. And uh, for some reason, I have no idea why I never asked him. He, uh, instead of calling me Bill, he called me William. And instead of it coming out as William, it came out as William. So he always called me William. And then about three years after working for him, he walked into my office one day and he said, William, you should buy this company. Um, you know, I'm, ge- I'm getting old. I really can't do anything with it. And um, it was a great, it was a great story. He was uh, just an old hardline German guy. And I said, well, Monty, I'll tell you what, I, I'll, I'll, I'll buy the company, but, I, but you know, I need a couple of years because I don't have any money. He goes, well, you could, you could borrow the money from me 
And I said, well, <clears throat> tell you what, I'll do that. But there was 30 people, one office. And I said, you know, there's about 15 of them here that probably don't have the, you know, the character and, and represent what I would want a company to represent. So I, I need, for these two years, I want total control over hiring and firing. And he said, I could do that. And he goes, but William, I have one proviso for you as well. And I'm thinking, okay, he wants to sell me his company. He just gave me total control. I'm 34 years old. What can go wrong from here? And he looks at me and goes, I can't afford to pay you. And I said, say, say that again? He said, I, I can't afford to pay you. And I looked at him. I shook his hand. I said, I'm in. And so for the, the next two years, I uh, you, built his company for him. And uh, then I bought it at 37. And, um, you know, fast forward 24 years, we, you know, if there's 4,000 with mortgage brokers and banks and savings and loans and credit union, if there's 4,000 places to get a mortgage in America, we started 24 years ago in dead last place. And at the end of uh, last year, at the end of 23, uh, by Inside Mortgage Finance, we were the 46th largest lender in America. Uh, we have almost 2,000 employee partners, about 160 uh, locations spread out around the country. And, um, you know, we're shooting to go into the top 25 uh, in the country, and that includes all banks, savings, and loans, and so forth. So in 24, that's the story. Uh, and in 24 years. Wow. And you're sticking to it. And, and we want to applaud that. Story. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Number one, I love those stories. I, I almost feel like I know the house you grew up in. Can you describe the house that you grew up in? Oh yeah. So it was, uh, it was about, it was a ranch, uh, three bedroom, uh, one and a half bath, uh, about, uh, oh my gosh, probably about mm, 1100 square feet. Mm -hmm. And, um, we loved it. We loved it. And actually, just about four months ago, you know, my we lost my mom in 2015. Uh, my dad passed uh, two years ago. And my younger brother just sold that house that we grew up in uh, about uh, three months ago. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yep. Wow. As you drive through those Northeast Ohio communities, I think of Bedford, I think of Parma, I think of Maple oh, yeah. Heights. Oh, yeah. if, if walls could talk, right? Yeah. The absolutely. stories that could yeah. be told, the family traditions, the things yeah. That, that, yeah. Those are, you know, those are the quintessential, you know, middle class uh, of America. And, you know, the, the um, in our generation anyway, the, the real backbone of the country in that first ring suburbs, right? They call them those first ring suburbs mm -hmm. all around the country. So it was, uh, it was a great place to grow up. Rob, you grew up on the Ohio side of that river, not just right across from West Virginia. My family grew up on the P Pennsylvania side of that river. See, all right. See. And, 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 and Bill, you're from that area. Number one, I'll All tell you. started the river, huh? Yeah. And you, you're never going hungry if you came up from that part of the country. No, because no, because no. those folks know how to cook. <laughs> <laughs> they know how and, to cook. Wonderful people, uh, warm people. And uh, yeah, salt of the earth, as they say. So it, it's it's an exciting story because it is come up, it does come up from the ground, and it's a beautiful story because it's a, a man and his family pulling this all together. Um, now you're 37 years old. Were you married at the time? Uh, I was. Yeah, I got I got married when I was 28. Um, married to my wife Paula. Now, gosh, going on 30. Actually, Thursday. Um, it'll be 33 years this coming Thursday. Congratulations. What was yeah. Paula's idea of you buying this company? She, you know, she was pretty agnostic about it at, at that point. Um, you know, at that point we were together, married about less than 10 years and, and she, you know, she, she always knew, uh, my passion for, for real estate, for real estate finance, home ownership. And she was, um, she grew up in Brunswick and she was pretty agnostic about it. And she just felt that, uh, you know, if it, if it was my passion, you know, she would support that and, um, you know, didn't blink an eye, really didn't blink an eye. So Bill, we've, we've looked at your company and, and we certainly, uh, celebrate the success and, and feel like Thanks. Union Home is one of the good guys that's out there. Thank you. Now, uh, are there bad guys? In the history of this business, have there have been place times where there things have gone wrong and there have been companies that have fallen off the ledge? 
Well, I think, you know, I think just like in anything in life, right, there's probably, you know, 90, 95% good and 5% bad. Um, you know, our business is unique. I think everybody probably feels that. But our business is unique where you're dealing uh, with, you know, home ownership and home financing and generally the largest purchase of, of a person or a family's life. Um, you're dealing uh, with a lot of money. You're dealing with finances. You're advising folks on their income and on their expenses and what a mortgage payment will be and so forth. And so, you know, I think mo and it's heavily regulated. So I think, I think most people uh, really do it right. Um, at times over the, you know, 38 year career, uh, at times I have seen um, some business practices that were not acceptable, but quite honestly, you know, not, not as many as you would think. There's not many and, and certainly in these days less uh, because we are more heavily regulated. When I entered the industry in 1986, there was absolutely no regulation whatsoever. Uh, there was none. So other than, other than the people around you, there was no regulation. Today, there's a tremendous amount of regulation. So uh, I think in the early days, maybe more so. Uh, today, not so much. So 86, when you entered, that would have been coming off the, you know, my dad always tells the story at, they bought their first home in 81, yep. 80, 82. Yeah. They were 17% uh, interest yeah, rate. Yeah, 17. Yep. He, yeah, he says, he said he got a deal at like 16 and a quarter or something, <laughs> sure. he tells me. Sure. And they were 21, 22, 23 years old, him yep. and my mom. Yep. And um, it's just amazing to think about that yep. and where it's come from. Back in those days, when I literally, I started my career in, uh, in June 1st, like 1985, and I stenciled. The stencil, there's no computers. I stenciled an interest rate. And I think at that point it was like 13.5 fixed was the interest rate. And that's, that's where I, that, that was the first day uh, that I was in the mortgage business. The fixed rate mortgages that were 13.5%. And we're going to pause for just a moment on this edition of the Public Square. Today's guest, Bill Cosgrove of Union Home Mortgage. When we come back, Dave will ask about real estate and the American dream. So you stay with us. We're found online at thepublicsquare.com. Introducing the latest program from the Public Square. Kids on the Square. We at Kids on the Square are dedicated to helping teach the next generation through topics like Bible stories, scientific marvels, and American history. We want to equip parents with fun and free educational resources to share the truth with their children. Won't you join us? New episodes are released monthly. You can listen wherever podcasts are available and visit kidsonthesquare.com to find out more. Thank you and... Welcome to Kids on the Square! Spreading the light of liberty across the land. Now back to the public square. Here on the public square, let's return to the conversation. Our guest, Bill Cosgrove, CEO of Union Home Mortgage. Dave? How important is real estate to the concept of, of the American dream? Of becoming economically free. Oh, I think it. I think it's everything. The uh, David. I think it's everything. I think studies have shown, and you know, rent renting a home, renting an apartment um, is good. I think housing, as long as it's safe and affordable, and and it's a it's a place where people and families, um, you know, can form. Is you know, rental property is is fine. And renting is fine, but you know, study upon study has shown that over a 25 year period, um, the average homeowner family, you know, has a net worth of upwards of 175 to $220,000. And the average renter uh, over that same span of, of 20, 25 years has a net worth under $20,000. So I, I think when you look at, you know, the stability of neighborhoods, the, um, safety, uh, you know, the pride of ownership, uh, everything that comes with it and investing back into 
whether it's fixing the art or, or you know, rehabbing the home. Uh, I think the backbone, the true backbone of America is, is home ownership. And we have, we have the most successful um, home ownership structure that the world has ever seen. And I think sometimes it's taken for granted. Um, sometimes it's like anything else that, you know, people stop working on it. Um, and it becomes sort of an afterthought, but, you know, as we sit, we have, we have the greatest, uh, home ownership structure that has ever been created on the face of the earth. And I'm proud of that. Now, as we said, we also have what many people call a crisis in people being able to get into a home and trade in, in, in homes. Uh, people consider this a real estate crisis. Is that an accurate description? It is. It is, Dave. And I do too, quite honestly. And I think the, uh, the crisis has been brewing for 20 years. It, it, it's too difficult to build a home. It's too difficult for investors. It's too difficult for developers to develop homes, develop tracts of homes to develop uh, streets. Um, you know, the regulation is unbearing. There's too many layers of regulation between uh, the cities, the states, the municipalities, the counties, the EPA. It's too difficult. Uh, you have labor shortages. You have material shortages. And, um, you know, with that, you, you also, and, that, and that's, you know, and obviously you've got a growing population, right? And that's coupled with the fact that the real housing boom in the country, when I started uh, financing homes in Ohio in the 80s, believe it or not, it sounds a little crazy, but the homes that, that I started my career fi uh, financing were built after World War II. They were the, ba the original baby boom of, of after World War II. Those were the homes that were built. Well, fast forward, you know, do the math, right? On, on your fingers, that post-World War II, late 40s, early 50s houses that were built are now 75, 80 years old. So not only have you had not enough houses built over the last 20, 25 years, the inventory that the greatest generation was built on, that inventory is crumbling before our eyes. So, you know, whether it's in, in Cleveland, uh, Pittsburgh, Buffalo, Detroit, you name it, every great city in the country, the housing is crumbling. And there hasn't been a plan, a real plan to fix that uh, either. So, so you really got it from both ends. Mm -hmm. And it, together, it, it's really created a real estate crisis. And now it, it turns into an afford, it's, it's old supply and demand. So now it's turned into an affordability crisis. And you could really see the proof of it because as interest rates has went up over the last year to uh, 18 months now, every other time home values come down because affordability is under pressure. Well, we have such a shortage of homes in America that even though interest rates have went up, you, you haven't had home prices come down at all. So if mm -hmm. anything is proof that we are dealing with a true housing shortage in America, is it's what's played out over the last 18 months. So what role then do high interest rates play in this? Um, I mean, one, we understand it's, it's a lot more expensive, but right. what kind of pressure does that add to an already existing? I mean, if interest rates were zero, the crisis you've described would still be there. So how do interest rates being as high as they are accelerate that? Well, actually, it, it, in historically, it should have the exact opposite. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Approach. Yep. Right. Yep. Right. So yeah, supply and demand. You think the interest rates go up? The yeah, the price will come down. And the help price out. comes down yeah. a little bit, and there's more homes for yeah. sale. And so, and so that's you know that's been the beauty of real estate in the real estate market. It's it's self regulating like a thermostat where everybody wants it to get at six seventy two, and if it's at seventy, the heat turns on. If it's at seventy five, you know the air conditioning turns on, and you eventually get to seventy two. Well the real estate market is not getting to 72. It's out of whack. And, and the proof is right in front of our eyes 
because, you know, by historical standards, if, if we had a normal supply of single family homes, you would have the average price of a home down in this interest rate environment, about 15, 18%. And actually you haven't had that at all because of the shortage. Well, I think that's one of the things that have been talked about over the past 12, 18 months is, okay, it's going to pop. Okay, they're going to come down. They're going to come down. And <laughs> month after month, you see nope. them continue to climb or hold steady. Right. But they're not, they haven't dropped to come and, down. And right. They haven't, Robin. So, something's got to give because one of the things we've learned in the bubbles, like the, the bubbles out in California, you know, there's always every 15 years, there's a bubble in Phoenix, right in Arizona. There's been bubbles in Florida. And, and what happens is when, uh, and I'm not an economist, I'm a CEO, but, you know, I've, 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 I've learned a thing or two hanging out with those guys and girls over the years. But one, one of the things you've learned is when, when the average price of a single family home is in the stratosphere compared to the median income in that area, something's got to give. Something's got to give, and that's where a bubble happens and the bubble bursts. But this time, I'm, I'm just not sure that a bubble actually bursts because there's such a shortage of real estate. What I fear is that, you know, real estate is the gateway. Single-family homes have been the gateway to wealth and security for the middle class. Well, in today's real estate market, I don't want to be as dramatic as saying that you're you're pricing out the middle class of home ownership and you don't want home ownership to become, you know, for the for the upper echelon or the wealthy. But if if we don't really as a as a country look ourselves in the mirror and and figure out, you know, supply and demand with housing, that's where we're headed. Well, in in the business that you're in, in the mortgage business, the lending business. You just hit on the fact of if prices get so high that they're disproportionate to the median income right. in that community, how does that impact you on an everyday basis from a bottom line? Because then it becomes, well, this house is worth this. They make this. How can they pay their bills? That's right. That's right. And and obviously through Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, uh, FHA, VA, you know, there are there are federal lending guidelines that that we have to adhere to. Um, all in all, they're good. All in all, they make sense. Um, and all in all, they work. And, um, you know, there, there's pressure on them uh, because the home prices are getting so high. And although income has, you know, has gone up, it, it just hasn't, you know, kept pace in proportion, right? And that's, and that's the problem, Rob. So there's, there's you know, I, I tell people that, you know, we really need a wake-up call in America because the 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 housing system that is that is really a, a, again, I think, the backbone of America. It's really under stress like never before. I just my opinion is over the last 20, 25 years, it's been ignored. It's been just on cruise control, and um, it, it's it's something that really the, I think the country. I think Washington uh, needs a wake-up call and say, you know, we, we've got to reinvest in the system. we got to reinvest in single-family homes. It's funny, and, and, you know, it's difficult for me as the CEO of Union Home Mortgage to get very political. The only, the only alley I allow myself to get political is, is the swimming lane of, of home ownership. That's, mm-hmm. that's where I allow myself. And it's funny that, you know, I do a lot of work, uh, like many do. I do a lot of my share of work in Washington um, and, and deal with Congress on, on housing issues. And, you know, they're finally starting to get it because their grandsons and granddaughters generally, uh, or, you know, or they're, they're just adult kids, they can't find a home to buy. And the ones Across they can the buy— yeah. Are, are across country yeah. are are not affordable. So actually, Congress is starting to pay attention to it because lo and behold, it's affecting their family too. 
Well, there's more to come in this conversation with Bill Cosgrove, our guest here on The Public Square, CEO of Union Home Mortgage. If you joined us late, why not go online to listen at thepublicsquare.com or make use of our smartphone app. It's free in your app store and you can download programs and take them with you, listen at any time. The Public Square in your app store. More to come. Let's rejoin the Public Square team now as our guest Bill Cosbro talks with them today about home mortgages and a behind-the-scenes look at this fascinating topic. Here's Dave. There are people who would say to themselves, wait a second, one plus one equals what here? If interest rates are sky high, well, then somebody's got to be making that money because of the big interest. So wouldn't the mortgage companies be saying, what, what crisis? I mean, okay, interest rates are high. Well, that's the way it is. But so who's making the money or is there any money being made out of this crisis? Well, you know, when interest rates are higher, that doesn't mean mortgage companies are actually making more money. Um, you know, actually. That would be a, a common a, misunderstanding, wouldn't it? It'd be a common misunderstanding. Yeah. So the, you know, the interest rates are higher, which means, you know, you're paying more interest to the bondholders and it's, it's taking this amount of interest based on the, the current inflation in the country, yeah. right? And arguably over the last year, if the inflation rate has has been somewhere in, in a blended 4%, right? Mm -hmm. And if the current, you know, interest rates are in the sixes and sevens, it all kind of makes sense. So it's actually the bondholders um, that receive more interest. But in the meantime, everyone's assets are getting eaten away based because of inflation. So I think the margins, whether, you know, if you, if you go back to inflation being at 1% and mortgage rates being at three or four, right? It's the same concept is inflation being at 4% and, and bond rates in interest rates being at six. You know, we talk about the interest rates up and down and we think it wasn't that long ago, they were below three. I mean, I, right. I'll use the Walgate family for an example. I mean, yeah. we're, we have a really nice interest rate. And right. We're looking at possibly moving and making a move. And, you know, we looked and while we have equity and stuff built up, mm -hmm. we're like, man, it's hard. So people Doesn't like- make sense. Uh, yeah, people yeah. like us that are saying, yes, we'd like to right. keep it going, move along. Uh, yeah, financially, it's just you not the there. right decision. Well, think about, so think about this, Rob. So you you don't want to trade a 3% mortgage for a six, but if these were historical principles of real estate, the home you were going to purchase- Right. At move up to or or move down to, at six percent interest rate, was should be the home value should be discounted, ten to twenty percent, be, because buying power is less. So now you've got right. the combination of a higher interest rate and the value of that home kept has kept going up, and so it's it's kind of a lose lose today. Yeah, for move for move up. I just, I wish that I could simplistically pin the tail on the donkey somewhere. So let's take a minute because sure. I'm thinking about what people listening across the country are going, okay. All right. So we check that one off the list. It's not the mortgage companies. They're not the bad guys. It's sure not the real estate people because they're losing their shirts. I mean, people are getting out of the real estate business left right. and right. Okay. Is it the Fed? Can, can, we, can we talk about the Federal Reserve? Are they the ones that are doing this? Well, I don't think so. I, I, you know, Dave, it's, I don't think there is a bad guy, right? Uh, I think there's a, uh, there's a capitalistic society that, that actually works pretty well. You know, the ecosystem of capital, capital works very well. And the Federal Reserve is doing their job in their mind. Uh, others can debate this, but, you know, from my perspective, they believe that Price inflation uh, is a is a cancer to a family's long term viability to wealth. Right? If, if every if every year prices are going up five six percent 
I, you know, then in two years, it's 12%. Three years, it's 18%. In four years, everything costs 25% more. Uh, the Federal Reserve feels that that erosion um, has does great damage to families and to the economy. So I think the, um, the Federal Reserve is doing a good job. You know, the inflation that was created, sort of a one-time monster inflation that was created off of COVID and then supply mm-hmm. chains being disruptive, disrupted, that's what they're dealing with today, right? You had mm-hmm. 40 years of, of low, in, 35 years of low inflation, and lo and behold, it, it right, right after COVID, it rages, so I think the the Federal Reserve is doing I I think a, a fine job of of raising interest rates without completely choking off the economy, but trying to bring uh, prices down. Now I'm talking about prices of all goods of everything, not of just everything. homes, yes. not just homes, not just homes. So I, I I think they're doing a fine job. Um, I think what what you have is I think you have the supply chain in the world still trying to, to catch up. Right. You go to the grocery store. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, I went to the grocery store in Florida and, you know, Paula gave me a little list of things and, and I went to the grocery store and the bill was four hundred dollars. And I looked in the trunk of the car and there, there was almost like nothing there. And yeah. I, I was I was shocked at that. Um, it just hit me as I as I looked in the trunk before I slammed it to go back home. There was nothing there. So you you know you have price inflation all over, and I think ultimately housing is just simply, you know, this has been twenty years in the making where you truly have a real shortage of homes uh, that are available, and again we we've got to develop as a country some really good rehab programs uh, that help the inner city and the suburbs that I grew up in. The, now the middle class is having problems with with acceptable, safe, healthy, affordable homes that are not, you know, uh, under a lot of duress. And so I think we're we're just in that we're in that transition period where it's almost like we've ridden the horse for twenty five years, and and the horse has treated us all pretty well, right? And and now the horse is tired. Uh, and 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 we need we need to treat the horse better to bring it back, and that that's really where real estate is in in the United States today, in home ownership and single family home ownership. So let's talk about solutions. Is this something that happens bottom up, top down? Uh, where do we start? And and if if anything, is this something people can do anything about? Is yeah. this is there is there a public policy alternative that might help solve this situation? So, so it's a great it's a great question. In the in the answer I give, uh, may upset some people um, because you know today is a today's a battle of more government, less government. Um, you know, government's not the answer. You know, in in and there's a there's a raging debate in all of that, and I just believe that. Um, I, there's 176 million single family homes in the country. And I, I honestly believe that in order to fix this over the next decade, and we're talking about a, you know, there's not a short term fix here. It, it's taken 20, 25 years to get here. There's not a short term solution. We say that often on this it. show. We didn't get here overnight. No, we're not getting out of this that's mess right. overnight. That's right, Rob. So it, I look at it, and I and so when's the last time a president um, has ran on a platform? Not and obviously we're in a we're in a, a crazy unusual time in presidential politics. But let's let's put that all aside. We'll for make a it purely theoretical. Go ahead. Theoretical. Yeah. Let's make it theoretical. When was the last time in any presidential debate, any presidential um, speech? campaign speech, even when the president, uh, you know, was sitting in office, when have they made housing a priority? When is single family homes, when has housing been a priority at all um, from a presidential platform? 
zero point zero, right? Even in a Senate, uh, it, it just zero point zero. So it, it's really been totally taken for granted. I really believe that the the first step in solving, you know, the, the, uh, it sounds like uh, this is pretty prototypical, but you know, the first step in in solving a crisis is actually admitting there is a crisis, yeah. right? Yeah, and, yeah, and, right. And Saying I think, it out loud, right? Right, right. And so, you know, I've dealt a long time with the Mortgage Bankers Association of America, and I think they do a great job working with real estate. We're we're working with the politicians and and the legislators and saying listen it is it is time that is a is a country we recognize there's not enough single family homes in the country to support our population growth and the inner cities have got to be rebuilt they've got to be invested in and they've got to be rebuilt so in my mind the solution starts with a with a with a public private partnership some type of programs um, that the federal government sponsors, and and whether it's in the form of tax credit, whether it's in the form of opportunity zones, whether it's in the form directionally of those type of things, you need a tremendous amount of, of private and public uh, support and programs that are developed that can help rebuild uh, the inner cities. And I think the whole ecosystem of how developments are created, sewers are put in, infrastructure are put in, and and how do you do that and who has to approve it and where do you find the land to do this? Uh, I think all this has to be relooked at in almost think tank fashion um, to look at the entire ecosystem. Because the current, you know, the ecosystem that, that we've grown up with, with housing, Um, I I think the country has outgrown it. Dave and Alan and Rob will continue the conversation with guest Bill Cosgrove. Coming up, they'll talk about taxes here on The Public Square. We will be right back for more on The Public Square. As always, thanks for your support of The Public Square each week on this station. We have other programs available on many radio stations, but it's all online at thepublicsquare.com and with that smartphone app. All right, let's continue the conversation now with our guests today. So our state and federal governments, our county governments spend boatloads of money. They, they spend a lot of money, and it's, it's which means they've got the money because they're getting it from all businesses, they're getting it from individuals, they're getting it from income tax and, and sales taxes. There's plenty of money being dedicated. Is this a situation where we've got to change priorities? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I, I think, Dave, it's a reprioritization of the funds, number one. But I but I also think, too, is the, the process of building developments, building homes, uh, building tracks of, of 100, 200, 300 single family homes. I think the process is broken and dysfunctional. Mm-hmm. And you have, you have cities, counties, municipalities, different government agencies. You got 15 government agencies that you got to get approval for, yeah. right? Yep. And one of yep. them doesn't like you or you don't like them. And and I and I think small town and small mind politics uh, are too much in play in in real estate development, and and I think the whole ecosystem needs to be looked at, and I think government in in a lot of ways is the problem, um, and and everybody you know there's too many hoops to jump through, and I understand their safety, their soundness, there's there, you know water is important. Um, resources are important. And I understand that the government has a role in that. But I think the whole system of, of you know, the hoops you got to jump through in order to build, develop and to build single family homes, I think it all needs to be looked at. Bill, can states get involved? Like, you know, there's, there's different states right now. Where there's a lot of growth going on, a lot of excitement economically, people moving to places. Well, let's say that a, a governor in a state with a, a legislative uh, partnership 
decided they were going to look down the line at all those places where there are inhibitors uh, that are keeping those kinds of home tracks being built and said, okay, because the state has the legal authority to instruct counties and municipalities on what the rules are going to be, we're going to change some of the rules. Even if they do it as a, as a, as a test case, even if they create a, a form of a state-based enterprise zone, we're saying here, here, and here, those rules aren't going to af- apply anymore. Is that remotely possible as, an, as, a, as a way to start? I think it is. I, I think it's remotely possible. Uh, there's some states that, that are, are more progressive in, in business-friendly. I, I think governors can set the tone. You know, nowadays, the, um, you know, water is important. I, I do believe, uh, you know, the EPA, um, you know, resources, uh, clean energy, all of these things are important and all of these things matter. But I think it, it all needs to be looked at and rethought. And you, you have this fragmented system of, of developing land, building homes that is totally broken. And everywhere across the country you go, it's different because you mm-hmm. got all these local municipalities and, and local governments in er, county to county it's completely different. And, and I think we, we all got to take a step back and, and take a look at the whole and say, you know, what, what, are, what are best practices today where, you know, we understand, you know, water conservation, we understand, um, you know, that grading matters, right? Where water's flowing is matters, you know, what chemicals are in the ground. All these things matter. But today, the system is so fragmented and broken that it, it is very difficult uh, to build single-family homes. Very difficult. There are some places where homeowners have to play, a, a, home builders have to pay a whole lot of money to the municipality where they want to build on top of everything else. It's like if you want to build a house here, oh, by the way, it's going to cost you X thousands of dollars to build the house. I'm not right. talking about permits. I'm talking about Thanks for showing up. It'll cost you this much to put the first shovel in the ground. I, I think that's quite a discouragement for 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 smaller builders. Am I am I am I right about that? I don't have any any specific knowledge of that because I'm not a developer. You know, I'm not a builder. Um, but I think that all of when it comes to single family homes, developing, building, rehabilitation. Um, the amount of layers of government and and government regulation, government rule, government cost, um, although well intended, and I understand the reason it's there uh, to protect the consumer, uh, but I think the that system has become uh, too vast, too overbearing, and um, it, it's almost as if, to a certain extent, the, you know. The, the government hoops one hoop after another after another has become the problem and a discouragement and from a people discouragement. wanting to be Absolutely. involved in the process and right. continue down that road right and, and and I wonder if too if that could be some of the reason that we see some of the, we talked earlier in the program about the home ownership lacking maybe that pride factor maybe where people say you know what it's just easier to go along and rent or to see this conglomerate yeah. that buys up a bunch of homes and be there yeah and that's unfortunate because I think that takes away from what makes this country great. It it, it does, Rob. And I, I I'll say another thing that that you know even the Wall Street Journal, others, and I I respect the Wall Street Journal and their writers, and others in the media. But but off of COVID, you know they're talking about that the the younger generation today is a renter generation. They don't want to. Yeah. They don't want the responsibility. Well, they don't want to own anything, right? Well, it's it's you know three years after COVID. And you look at, you know, you look at them as, as they become young professionals in their early 20s to mid 20s, you look at that person in their early 30s. Maybe they're married, maybe they're not, maybe they've had a child, maybe they're not. But guess what? You know, the studies are showing that, that many of them want, uh, you know, they have a, the same desire for home ownership as the other generations. So sure. I think I think the demise of home ownership in America 
this idea that this the younger generation is a strictly renter generation. Uh, I, I think that's been overblown and not true. And so, you know, I think the desire for home ownership uh, is is there as strong as it's always been. There's no doubt that that you know over the last five years there's been a tremendous amount of rental property built, right? High end, yeah. very high end rental property. Uh, but when someone's family situation changes and you name it, you know, if they're paying $3,000 for a beautiful rental unit, right. In a pretty posh, uh, place it, you know, as life marches on and they get a little older and a little more mature, um, you know, that $3,000 mortgage payment goes a lot further. Yeah. Right. So, so I, I think the demise of, of single family homes is, uh, and the demise of home ownership has, has been, you know, drastically uh, overstated. We're getting a firsthand perspective on real estate and home mortgages and home ownership from Bill Cosgrove, our guest today of Union Home Mortgage. Now, if you have to leave us at this time, as some stations cut away, we urge you to listen online to the remainder at thepublicsquare.com. More of the interview there, thepublicsquare.com. We'll be right back for more on The Public Square. Every day, 535 people are charged with representing all of us in Washington, D.C. They preside over the largest budget in the world. They hold the Constitution in their hands. They can help protect our liberties or look the other way. 535 people. We put them in office. Isn't it time that we hold them in our prayers? A public service message from the American Policy Roundtable. Spreading the light of liberty across the land. Now back to the public square. One more segment of conversation now with our special guest, Bill Cosgrove. He's CEO of Union Home Mortgage, and he's talking with Dave Zanotti, Rob Walgate, and Alan C. Duncan. Bill, you mentioned um, there needs to be some kind of a, of a think tank, some sort of a consortium uh, where the people that know this stuff, like you and others, get together. Um, it, it, so I'm thinking to myself, people are thinking to themselves, oh, wait a minute now, where's, is this going to happen at Carnegie Mellon, is it going to happen at Northwestern? Is it going to happen at Berkeley or Stanford or Harvard? Where's the Where's the magic group going to get together and say, okay, everybody drop all their swords and everybody drop all their 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 titles? How are we going to fix this thing? Um, are right. you aware of anything like that that's going on? Uh, I think there's a lot of people talking about it. Um, you know, there are the politics of Washington is there's a group crusading that, you know, the government should have nothing to do with housing whatsoever. And, um, you know, although... Friend, that's, a, sh- that's a long haul to get there that's from where haul. we are today. You know, I'm generally, I'm generally a, uh, on average, this is a 10,000-foot view. I'm generally a smaller government guy than a larger yeah. government guy. Sure. But the idea that the government, uh, if this... Put it this way, if this was a completely private uh, market for for mortgages, for capital into home own, real estate finance, uh, this country would be a mess, an absolute mess. So I get that there's a there's a group of, of politicians in Washington that say, you know, the government should not be in housing whatsoever. Um, they are... It's ill-conceived. They're they're, they're misinformed, and I understand that if if directionally that's how they feel politically, it it just doesn't work in housing in America because it's too vast. Well, and the toothpaste is all over the counter on that one. I mean, Absolutely. we're not getting it back in. I don't think. No, we could we could move in a direction of less regulation, but you, you can't get well, there we can in move a in, snap. Yeah, in not cap, you know, not capital flow. Right. The, right. the capital flow cannot be private, completely private, but the, um, the regulation can. So I think it's, I think it's really a matter 
of think t- some think tanks in Washington, uh, some politicians, some ex housing officials, uh, us, you know, at the Mortgage Bankers Association. Full disclosure: I was chairman of of the National Association in 2015 and 2016. I think there's enough housing experts and housing finance experts and and people like me and others that have spent our entire career uh, in the ecosystem of, of housing in this country that really see the fact that we're in a crossroads. Um, they see the fact, and, and, and we're talking to the legislators and uh, the folks running for political office to say, you know, this has got to be part of your platform. This is, it's got to be housing in the country has got to be a priority again, period. Let me interject as a nonpartisan organization that does not take money from political parties, doesn't even necessarily care for their existence. And sometimes they're not so happy about ours. But the point <laughs> is this, everybody's got to live somewhere. Right. I don't care what your political party is, right. your socioeconomic status, your skin color, your family status. Everybody needs a roof over their head. That's if right. If any issue should be completely nonpartisan, this ought to be the issue. You know, well, well said, my friend. Well said. And, you know, the other part of this, too, is that who doesn't want to live in a neighborhood that is safe, right, uh, where, where you know your neighbor's to the left and right, and and there's really a community feel. And you all own your own home, and you have that. You're cutting the grass. You 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 know. Yeah. You're having a little maybe hey, look, competition. Some of us don't like cutting grass as much as others, Rob. I'll take I'll take a zero well, lot line. If, I'm okay you know, with that. It, but but even you know <laughs> even the healthiest of communities has that blend, right? Of single family homes, some condos, yes. some rental properties. You know, maybe a rental tower or two in the, in the city. Um, so I, so I think that when, when it, you know, the fundamental, as you said, Dave and Rob, the, the fundamental, uh, right in American is, is, you know, your neighborhood, your community and, and, you know, where you live and how you are part of that community and you want it to be safe. Um, you, you want it to be friendly, uh, and, and you want to live, you know, uh, free, uh, and, and you want to live with, with friends around you. And it's, it's, it's all part of the, the basic human need. And, um, you know, in large part, that's what we're talking about here. I've been seeing, seeing articles and news stories popping up about private equity businesses buying right. up whole neighborhoods yeah. Yeah. and essentially removing them from the market. Is that yeah. something you're watching and, and could speak on at all? What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, it's a, it's a, great, it's a great question. So if you'd have told me 20 years ago that there would be corporations that either are created for or a piece of, of them uh, in private equity uh, or in in a type of structure like that, that was created to actually invest their capital, invest hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars in, in buying single family homes. 20 years ago, I call you crazy. But the fact of the matter is, this is part and parcel of the problem. The fact is, you've got these corporations that have a bunch of smart people in them and they have they have raised billions of dollars of capital and they have to invest it somewhere. And when they choose as an inflation hedge, because there's a shortage of real estate, everything we're talking about here, they choose to say, you know what? We are gonna buy up thousands of homes, single family homes across the country. And we feel that over the next decade, because of the housing shortage, that this is a solid economic investment. It has nothing to do with a family, has nothing to do with an individual, but they're looking at this as a solid economic investment. That is proof in part and parcel that we have a problem, that we have a problem, right? If, if you had enough supply, then you, at that point, uh, those companies would not be interested in investing in single family real estate. 
period. Alan, thank you so much for asking that. It's a great question, question because that's a great question, and and I'm glad that it was held for you because I know you have a passion about this. Well, it's not, and it's not illegal, right. and it's not illegal. It's it's not unethical, but many of us look at it and say, you know, for for families and for communities. And, and for the average, you know, American, probably not a good thing. Probably not a good thing. But yet it's happening because of the housing ecosystem is out of kilter today. Thank you. Outstanding. Bill, let me just, we'll let, we've got uh, two minutes to say thank you a bunch. Thank you. We've so looked forward to this. It met, you exceeded every expectation. You really helped us. Thank you. Indeed. Thank you, Dave. And thank you to our guest, Bill Cosgrove, who is CEO of Union Home Mortgage. Much information there today. Great perspective. We appreciate Bill joining us very, very much. Thanks for listening. This program, of course, will be archived at thepublicsquare.com. Thanks for listening. The Public Square is a broadcast service of the American Policy Roundtable.